Okay, so we have a file to download today. Uh, so we're talking about loops, repeating actions in VBA. So unemployment.xlsm, it's, there's, there's nothing so special about this data. It's just some data for us to be able to loop over. It's kind of tough to start with a blank workbook and uh, look at loops. So I'll open this up, uh, enable content. And it seems like I set this up with the thought that we would actually be pulling data in. I wonder if those even work still. Um, I'm just going to give it a go, although we, we won't end up using this. Let me just uh, look at the code, Alt F11. And so there's actually some code in here that will kind of automate web queries. Now for this assignment that we're doing for the Fallen Angel assignment, the idea, the whole idea behind the assignment isn't so much about interacting with web servers. This is kind of a fun place to, to be. The idea is record yourself doing something and then with relatively small changes to the code, actually get that code to be, to do something useful. Well here, this create web query procedure that I wrote just kind of skips the recording part and just says, it skips the, the web query wizard, which is the deficient part. The web queries are still great. It's the web query wizard that doesn't do so well. Uh, and this will just generate that automatically. So I think in module one, what do we have here? Uh, get data, import data for a particular stock. Oh, interesting. I wonder if this even works. Seems like when I made this example, it might be fun to actually loop across and pull data in, but uh, it takes so long to bring the data in that it just makes the loops too long to run. Well, so looks like we got some data here. And what was the one it was? Yeah, it looks like it didn't actually bring it in, but maybe that was part of the example that I wanted to do. Anyway, we'll just, we will live with the data that we have here already, but um, the code that's there might be instructive or interesting for you to look through sometime and see what it does. Um, we're getting the data. Yeah, all it's doing is bringing the data in. It's not actually bringing the data over. But uh, could you use this code like as part of your solution for Fallen Angel? Yeah, you could. But remember, what I'm trying to get you to do is record yourself doing something and make changes. If you wanted to start from scratch here and I'm going to use this as a, as a starting point, you can do that as well. Okay, uh, but let me just kind of push these down. We'll work here on the top of module one. So there are three different kinds of loops. There are fundamentally different kinds of loops. It turns out there are some other loops that are kind of like syntactic sugar that uh, kind of other ways to accomplish the same things. But there are three loops, uh, three looping structures in VBA that are all different from each other. One we have seen, uh, we've used quite a bit, the do loop. But there are some details in the loop that I haven't shown you yet. So let's go ahead and take a look at that one first. So let me make a sub procedure here called the do loop. Do loop. Uh, am I on the wrong keyboard? I'm on the Espanol keyboard. I'm so bilingual. Let's go to the English keyboard. Do loop. And that's just me being bad at on the keyboard. Uh, demo. Okay. So we could write a loop that would go across all 3,000. These are, by the way, just counties that are in the United States. Uh, so I guess apparently there's a county called Las Marias. Princip municipo. Municipio. Anyway, that's where, what state is that? Not a state at all, it's territory, Puerto Rico, but there's, uh, most of these are states, so Virginia, oh, here's Utah, we should be able to find us. We're in Utah County, Utah, and did I pass it? No, there's Utah, there's Utah County. Ah, so what is this up here? This is actually the whole state of Utah, so when you, when you, when you, um, aggregate data from the national census uh, using code 4900, that's saying, oh, that's the whole state of Utah. So it's not just, you're right, it's not just counties, there's states and territories as well, but you know, Utah County itself is this guy right here. Oh, by the way, um, we can look for my county, Gov County in Kansas. So Gov County, actually, that's where my name came from. Great, great, great grandma Phelps was crossing the plain. She stopped in Gov County, Kansas. They liked it there and they named the kid after the county. I always thought maybe he was conceived there, but doing a little family history, turns out, you know, he was born years later after their, their trip through. So, I don't know. Uh, okay, so let's just make a loop that, so we can make a loop that goes across all 3,000 some odd of these, but it actually takes a while to print those off. So let's uh, do a do loop here. We're familiar with, let me dim R, just a variable that I will use to go across different rows. Ha, huh, what data type should I use for this? Integer, not a bad choice. Um, how, many, how many counties do I have to work with? 
3,274 or so. Um, uh, and the range for integer is, uh, range for byte is 255, 0 to 255. But integer, which is a two byte integer, is plus or minus 32,000. I'll expect you that for the midterm, by the way. You know, roughly 32,000 plus or minus. Um, kind of a part of, no, of uh, being a good programmer in VBA is having a sense for what's the right data type to use. And so integer would be pretty good. I'm not gonna use integer. Um, I, instead, I'm gonna use a long integer. Now, long integer plus or minus two billion. I only got, I only got like 3,000 some odd, why use long? And the answer is, anytime I'm referring to a row in my code, I wanna use long. Now, in this particular example, I can get by with integer. But the last thing you want is to have something where you look at the data you're working with and you think, oh, you know what, integer is fine. Uh, and then you put your program in someone else's hands, they add some more data, and all of a sudden they add 35,000 rows, and integer just isn't quite big enough. Uh, and so if it's a row, I'm thinking, you know what, use long because, why? You can't have too many rows for that to fit. And what does it cost? What does it cost me to choose long over integer? One byte. Cost me a bite. It's tiny. So anyway, that's just my that's just my feelings on the subject. Uh, or that would be them are as long. Okay, now I'm going to set R instead of starting R off at two, which is a reasonable place to start. Why don't we initialize R to be three thousand? Um, and that way, when we loop, we're not looping across all three thousand two hundred seventy four. We're just looping across two hundred seventy four. Do and loop. Remember do says beginning of the loop, loop, end of the loop, go back to the top. What am I gonna put on the inside of this loop just to keep myself from accidentally putting myself into an endless loop? Do events. What does do events do? Do events says, pause right here, just for the brief, briefest of moments, and try to see if your creator is trying to get your attention. I'm trying to break in, like am I sitting here trying desperately to get you to pause? And without the do events in there, that loop could be, the interpreter can be so focused on that loop that it just never looks up and it won't let you in, but that will make sure that you can break into it. It also allows for the screen to be updated and so forth. Okay, and all I'm gonna do now is increment r, r equals r plus one, and then I will do a debug.print of, hmm, I would like to make sure that I'm on the right worksheet. So let me dim s as a worksheet. Let me set s equal to this workbook dot worksheets. Which worksheet am I after? Counties. Counties. Okay. So now I don't have to use this long way to refer to this sheet. I can just use this. We'll refer to the sheet that I'm interested in. So I'm going to print s dot cells. Row number, R, column number, why don't we do column number three? And we'll print the value of that. So if I run that now, it should, oh, I put myself into an endless loop. That was awesome. It's totally, totally um, unanticipated. Now it'll fail eventually. Why will it fail? Eventually I'm gonna get down to 1.04 million rows. It will take a little while to get there. Um, and it'll try to go past the end of the worksheet. That'll cause an error. That will stop it. Ooh, thank goodness. Uh, but fortunately, because I have this do events in here, I'll be able to hit pause and it will pause right there. Because it paused right at that moment and said, oh, look at that. He's trying to get my attention. Now I'm going to loop. Um, we normally do it here is we're going to loop until. Now the way we've done this in the past is until this cell that I'm looking at has a value that's equal to a zero length string. And that should like terminate immediately. But let's, let me run it again because I had probably thousands of rows that I printed off there. There we go. So now I've just gotten through and stopped more appropriately. Maybe I'll also print out R here. So R comma, uh, and I'll run that. And so now I'm seeing the R, the value of R, as well as the name of the county that we're trying to print. Incidentally, when you're using cells, I'm not sure if I've shown you this before, but you can also for the, for, oops, for the column, you can specify a string. So you could say column number C or column letter C that we're after here. Uh, and that will do the same thing. Here's proof. 
So exactly the same thing. Okay, so this, at this point, this should be stuff we've seen before, although we haven't really talked about it formally. I've just said, here's a loop, kind of believe me, and then let's move on. So, questions on where we are right here? Yes, go ahead. So the question is, this used to be a three, and I changed it to a C, what's going on here? So when it's a three, whenever we use the cells method, we give it two indices. One tells it which row to use, one tells it which column to use. And so if I look at this loop, R is gonna start off at 3,000, and so it's gonna print row number 3,000, column number three, which is C3000. And so it'll print off whatever values in C3000, and we could go look and see that's what it is. But, uh, and then R will be, become 3001. We'll come back to the top and we will print still column three, but now row number 3001. And it will continue to do that. But the point was, is that for cells, you can specify a, um, a string indicating the column letter that you're interested in. Or, you know, like column A, 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 B, whatever that is. Question here? Question is how am I printing it in my immediate window? Yeah. So that's oh, how did I actually make that happen? Yeah. So debug.print is what sends it up there, and then you just click the play button here, or I'm hitting F5. So if I hover over that, what does it say? Yeah, it says run the sub, uh, and F5 is the hotkey that does that. Other questions? Yeah. So the question is, your debug dot print r comma s dot cells, whatever here, what's this r doing? And the answer is, I'm, I would like to see the, the value of that variable. So r is starting at 3,000. I'm incrementing it by one each time I'm through the loop. And I think we only have 200 rows here, so I can't quite get back to the, to the beginning. But I can see 3,076, 77, 78. That's just the value of r being printed up here. And so that's what that's saying, is that print r, and the comma says, you know, put a little space in there and then print whatever value I've got here. Oh, if I wanted the comma to print, I would, I would have to have a separate argument and then I could put something in quotes, right? Because quotes says to VBA, don't try to figure out, this doesn't mean anything to you. This is just a character, keep track of it and in this case, print it. But here without the quotes, it goes, oh yeah, I know what that means. That means I'm separating arguments for the print method. Other questions? Question here, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, you know, help me out to understand the syntax that we have here. And you're exactly right, S, I have, I have declared S as a worksheet, so it's an object variable. Remember object variable, someone can tell me when I declare an object variable, Am I allocating, I mean a worksheet, oh, it can have lots and lots of information. Am I allocating a lot of, a lot of memory to be able to store that worksheet or just a tiny bit of memory? Yeah, just a tiny bit because all it's doing is holding the address. It's holding the reference for where that, op that sheet is gonna be. And that's what happens here when I say set S equal to reference to this worksheet, it goes, okay, let's just remember where that worksheet is and store it in the variable S. So now S becomes another name for the, for the worksheet that I identified here. So on that worksheet, the county's worksheet, I'm talking about a particular set of cells, the one at whatever row I've specified, first time through, the row will be 3,000, and column number three, I'm gonna do until that value is a zero length string. That's, not, that's still kind of a weird way to say it. You know, if I was doing it until it was like Utah County, uh, Utah County, I don't know what it actually says for Utah County, but it just probably says Utah comma Utah. Um, C-O-U-T-N-Y, cow, T, anyway. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to continue to loop until this whole condition is true. Tell what is in the left-hand side of the equal sign is exactly equal to what's in the right-hand of the equal sign. So one of the ways that we say empty in VBA is quote, quote. That is a string with no characters in it. How much memory does it take to store, that, to store that value. There's no characters. How much memory does it take? Four bytes, because four bytes is the overhead for a string variable. We have to have four bytes that says how long is the string, and what do we have in, that, in this case? We have zero. In those first four bytes, we say zero, it goes, oh, I'm done. There's no actual data to read. 
Okay, so that's one way to say, is it empty? There's another way. There's actually a function called is empty. E is E-M-P-T-Y. See, I could, could just come run that in my immediate window to take a look at it, is empty. And what am I gonna put in here? Fred, or more appropriately, Nephi. Uh, is empty, that's not false, uh, that's, that's false. That, the expression in there is not empty. So is empty equals true. But if it is empty, uh, So let's look at the active cell. Maybe it pertains just to cells. So let's go over here. Okay, so right now it's not empty. Active cell, I think I say dot value. And that's false, but if I go into an empty cell and execute it, it's true. Oh, so you know, I don't know that much about empty. Is empty, apparently. I don't use it all that often. <laughs> I use double quotes. Truth is, is empty is probably faster than double quotes, but I'm not positive about that. So it looks like it, 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 it is relevant to a cell. It's gotta be a cell, not just any arbitrary expression. I wonder about this one, null. Yeah, even null isn't empty, that's interesting. So with a little bit of research, we could find out you know, exactly what is that meant to do. And my guess is it looks at a value of a cell and, and tells you it's empty. Oh, okay, yeah, so in the past when we've done this, we've looked at the active cell, like we're, we're actually changing which cell is active and saying until the active cell is empty, right. So this is a way for us to be able to refer to a cell without actually activating it. Now, you'll never see this in code that you record because when you record, you actually activate the cell and you do something with the active cell. Recorded code is really inefficient for that reason, is it activating, 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 activating. And it turns out that activating is a pretty expensive thing to do. Why, why would the activating be so expensive? Activate a cell. I mean, it, it doesn't cost you any money, but I mean, it probably takes processing power. Why? Because when you activate a cell, it, it updates what happens on the screen. If you, were, if you said, you know what, I've got, uh, I have a rich uncle, I said, buy whatever kind of computer you want, I'm going to pay for it. And you, and you said, I'm going to go find the most expensive laptop computer I can find. You're going to find one that's going to cost $5,000 or, or more. And what is that computer designed to do? Do you know? Can you tell me what that computer was, is built to? Yeah, yeah, but what's it, what's it meant for? They'll tell you this is a blank PC or a blank laptop. Gaming, yeah, this is a gaming laptop. What makes a gaming computer um, a good gaming computer? What's the big thing? Refresh rate, it's how fast it can refresh the screen. We wanna completely refresh that screen like 60 times a second. Um, and that's expensive. Like the ability to be able to manipulate that screen fast is expensive. So anything we do that changes what's on the screen, in VBA, VBA world is expensive. And activating cells changes what happens on the screen. So if you can write your code in such a way that it doesn't activate what's happening on the screen, uh, it's gonna be, it'll be much more efficient. You know? And I say the much more efficient, it depends on what you're doing. If, if most of what you're waiting for is waiting for a response to come back to a web server, activating a cell is not gonna give you much of a difference. But if you're just doing calculations and having to be activating cells in the middle, you might be able to reduce the speed of, uh, I mean, it, reduce the time it takes to run a procedure by half or even more by just not activating cells, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's, that's called um, relative references. So, right, yeah, yeah, so you're talking about that when you record a macro and you do offset, it says, here's some, here's some range, and then you say from that range dot offset something, and it's, it's really referring to that as whatever range that was, you're offsetting a certain number of rows and columns. But the thing that's really weird about the way it records is that at the end of that, it says dot range A1. Um, and that's, that's kind of separate from this. I, the truth is, unless I had the code in front, I don't even want to talk about that. Um, that dot range A1 at the end, you can always just get rid of that and your code will behave the same way if you really want to. Uh, it's unfortunate that it records that way. I wish it didn't, but yeah. Okay. So um, uh, have we actually run this yet? I'm not sure we ran this, but we should see that it does the same thing. It prints off those same 274, um, those same values. Okay. So 
let's suppose, so, so that's until. Until allows this loop to execute until the condition is true. There's another way out of this loop. And instead of using the keyword until, I will use the keyword while. While is exactly opposite of until. It will execute while the signature, as long as this is true, keep executing. If it ever becomes false, let me out. Until says, hey, if the thing ever becomes true, let me out. I'm a little bit, you know, uh, I'm a little bit upset with the makers of the language that they would make a different syntactic block here that we could have accomplished just by saying not with the old one putting not in front of it. Why did they do it? And, and the answer is the code reads better. Uh, instead of until not is empty, while is empty. The truth is it reads better. So that's, and then these are the kinds of the, of the trade-offs that they're making when they make the language. We're trying to make this as easy for my mother to learn as possible. I told my mother that I talked about her in class. She was over for dinner on Sunday. I talked about you in my class all the time. She said, oh really? Well, maybe I'll just come in and listen sometime. I said, you'd always be welcome. Truth is I would change what I say about her when she is here in the room. <laughs> I am not telling her that it's all recorded on YouTube for her to be able to find it. Okay. Okay. So, um, to while is empty. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, so, so what is this going to print? If I run this, what do you think? What's it going to print? Absolutely nothing. And the reason is, um, remember, is this true or false? Is empty. So first time here, I'm looking at row number 3,000, column number three. Is that empty? Row 3,000, column number three. I mean, I don't really want to go and find it, but I guess we could. Column number three, 3,000, there it is. Is that empty? Not empty. And so, is empty, this is going to be false. Do while, remember, while allows the loop to continue while it's true. This is false, and so we're done from the very beginning. We never even execute the loop. So you have those two options, until or while. Take your pick. If you only want to learn one, that's okay. Because you can do everything with one that you can do with the other. It's just a matter of reversing the value of this, which you can do with the keyword not. Now, but here's something else I'm not sure we've seen before. And that is, I can put either of those clauses at the bottom of the loop. What is this going to do? Yeah, it will print exactly one time um, because now it does not have any kind of check coming into this. So it starts right here and then it executes this, it executes this, boom, boom, boom. And now it says while this is true and it goes, wait a minute, that's false. And it lets me out immediately. So I only get through once. Now, sometimes at this point, it, it's easy to make the assumption, oh, I get it. If I put the condition at the bottom, it executes one more time than if it's at the top. And that is the wrong answer to this. How much code executes between when I you know, process this loop and when I, well, actually it's this way. How much code executes between this do and this loop? Like in one iteration through, how many lines of code execute? Three, it's not a trick question, there's three. How many lines of code execute between this loop and the next time we get to the do? None, they are logically right, I mean, visually they're far, far apart from each other, but logically they are right next to each other. And so the only difference that happens on what, when I put this clause at the top or the bottom, the only difference is, will it be guaranteed to execute once? That's it. Because we, when we get to the second time, it, I mean, th that condition is right exactly next to this condition and no other code happens between it. And so it really doesn't matter. The only difference is, will it execute, is it guaranteed to execute once? Questions here? Is there anything, for me to anything else for me to tell you about the do loop? Do, loop, do events, while. I think that's it. There's, there's nothing else to it. It's a, it's a general purpose loop. Now, there's other kinds of loops. And the whole reason, by the way, could we do everything we want to with this loop? Yes. There is a, I'm going to show you two other kinds of loops, and there is nothing that we can do with those loops that we could not also do with the do loop. So why do these other loops exist? These other kinds of loops exist because there are some activities that are so common, we think we don't want to have to build kind of all the other code around this that we'd have to make the do loop work. The do loop's a general purpose loop. We can do anything. But we have some things that are so common, we think, you know what, we want a loop that's just designed for that, that will kind of reduce the amount of code. So, I'm, and I'm going to do that. The first one we're going to see is called the for next loop. 
So I'm going to copy my do loop demo and I'm going to make the for the for next loop demo. For next. Now I'm going to convert this exact code to, to, to do exactly the same thing using the for next loop. Now, what for next does is it says, one of the things that we do that is so common, it says, listen, I've got some block of code that I want to execute a known number of times. And uh, I'm going to give it a different value each time. I want this code to execute with a 12, and then I want it to execute with a 13, and then execute with a 14, and then, or in this case, I want to execute it with a 3,000, and then a 3,001, and then a 3,002. I mean, it's similar to what we're doing. But with the do loop, what we're saying is, we're, we're not sure how many times this is going to execute. At the end of each loop, check and see if we're done. The for next loop says, by the time we start the loop, we know exactly how many times we're going to execute. So uh, I'm still going to leave my uh, S uh, set up here. I'm still going to leave this. All right. Um, but, I, but now I need to know the, where I want to stop before my loop starts. So that means for this example, I mean, sometimes you just know this has run 10 times. But this one, I'm going to have to calculate. Well, let's do it this way. Let's just write the simple syntax, and then we will calculate um, what the real ending is. I mean, we know it's 3,274 is the ending. So let's just go ahead and see. So instead of do, we're going to say for. Now, this statement up here that in the do loop gave me my initial value for r, that becomes a part of the loop. So instead of being a separate line, I'm going to put it right here. For r equals 3,000. 3, to 3,274. Now, instead of loop at the end here, we are going to say next. And that's enough, but if we want to, we can say next R here. It used to be in the early days of basic, you had to say the name of the control variable again. Now it's like, well, what else could it possibly be? I mean, it's, this is matched up to one for statement. You don't have to put the R, but you can, you can put it there if you like. Yes. The question is, does do events work for all types of loops? And the answer is yes. So the do events, um, just, it just says, hey, I'm in this loop. Just pause for a moment here and take a look. Now, as it turns out, the do, when I have a for loop, I am much more comfortable to leave the do events out because the exit clause is built into the whole structure of the loop. Now, can I still put myself into an endless loop here? Yeah, with a little work, I can. Um, like, for instance, if, I, if inside this loop I said r equals r minus 1, then here's what happens. Yeah, r, r set equals 3,000. And then we come and print row 3,000. And now we're going to make r equal to 2,999. And I get to the next r. And what does next r does? Now, the loop only does one thing in, in the do loop event. What does loop do? Go back to the top. Next, in the for next loop, does two things. It says, go back to the top. And on your way, increment r. Make r go up by one. So if I move R down by one and then move R up by one, the next time through, it's going to be 3,000. For the briefest of brief moments, it will be 299, and it'll be 3,000 again. That's a, this, I, I've just made this into an endless loop. But the whole point is you don't need to manipulate the control variable inside the loop because the loop manipulates the control variable. So I've taken that code that was quite a bit longer with a do loop, and I've really kind of narrowed it down here. Now, I did kind of take out the the do events unnecessarily. We could put that back in, but I'm just kind of showing you it's really compact here. Go ahead. Oh, what happens if we skip over? Yeah, let's talk about that. I, I do want to address that. So, you know, what happens? So we're starting here at, uh, at 3,000. What happens if inside this I said R, e R, R equals R plus 2? So that I, never, I will never hit. That means each time through the loop, I'm going to be adding 3 to it. I'll never hit. The three, uh, the 74. Wait, will I? Um, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. No, no, it's not divis evenly divisible by three, so we wouldn't hit it. Um, but let's not do that. Let's, not, let's get there, but let's not do it yet. Instead, let's run this and see that it works in the vanilla version, and then we will um, run it a little bit more. Okay, so it still does exactly the same thing here. And the whole point is we say this is so common. You know, iterating a block of code a known number of times and, incidentally, 
having an integer that moves across a known range uh, that we have a range that, that we have kind of loop that just kind of has some of that kind of built into it. Could we do this with the do loop? Yeah, all, all we would have to do differently here is instead of checking what it was here at the end, we'd have to figure out where to stop at the beginning and then we do that. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's, let's uh, instead of having this hard coded, let's calculate this from the very beginning. So um, let me do this. I'm gonna come up here to my immediate window. Um, and even before I do that, let's come here. Let's say here you are. You're sitting here somewhere in the low 1000s, uh, in the high 1000s. And you're wondering, oh man, I've been going through this list of data forever. This is so long. How long is this data for crying out loud? What would you do in Excel to find out how long the data was? Control down. Yeah, just control down. Oh, it's 3274. I gotta go back up to the mid 2000s and keep doing whatever I was doing. You know, I'm gonna be here all day, but it's an internship. That's what they're paying me to do. So. It turns out back in the early days before the invention of the control key, how would you have done that? And the answer is there's another way to do it. It's the end key. So you have an end key on your keyboard. You may not have it on your laptop. Maybe you have an end key, maybe you don't. But on this keyboard I do. So I'm gonna hit the end key all, one finger at a time. Are you ready? End key, tap, and now down arrow, second tap. And that does exactly the same thing, end down. You'll notice that when you hit that end key, look right here on the screen, right next to the little record macro button. I'm gonna hit the end and oh, I am now in end mode. End mode. What does that mean? Remember, when you're in a different mode, besides normal mode, keys behave differently, right? When you're in cut copy mode, what happens? What does enter do instead of moving down? It pastes. When you're in end mode, down arrow does not move you down a cell like it normally does. It moves you to the end of the contiguous data. And then it pops you out of end mode. That's the way it goes. Now, the only reason I showed you that is not, you know, it's because in case someday your control key breaks, you need to be able to, um, you probably have two control keys. So you probably never need to know that for that reason. But the code, let's, let me, can we just come here to active cell, some here, A250, uh, 3250. Um, I'm going to say active cell dot end. A range method has, I'm sorry, the range object has a method called end. Um, and that's why I told you the end key used to do this because that's where the name comes from. So I'm calling the range method. I'm giving it an argument telling it, do I want to go down, up, left, or right? I want to go down. So the variable is XL down. The constant is XL down. And then I'm going to print the address of that. Now, um, first, I'm going to print two. I'm going to print the active cell's address. And then from the active cell, XL down. So it says my active cell is A3250, but the cell I'm referring to from that cell going down is, you know, this one that's the end of the contiguous data. Now, without looking at the Excel worksheet, what happens if I run this again? What will the active cell address be now? What do you think? I'm gonna run it again. I'm about ready to hit enter. Is it going to be 3250? Or 3274, uh, 30, 3274. It's still 3250. And the thing that's different about the way I use this through code, which, which besides using it on the keyboard and down, is that remember that in the Excel, it has to select it. There's no way to say, oh, think about this cell down somewhere else and then do something to it. But in VBA, that's exactly what it is. Unless I select it, I referred to. I have referred to that different cell here, but I haven't done anything to select it. And so I haven't changed the active cell. Active cell still where it was. So I can run this, you know, as often as I want. And then that active cell stays on A3250. Okay. So now the point is, I don't have to ask for the address. I could ask for the row. And that'll tell me now the row of that cell. And I don't have to start at the active cell. I could start at range A1. And that expression now will tell me the end cell that has the contiguous data. Did I select it? No, I just referred to it long enough to find out what row it was on. So now instead of hard coding 3274 here, what can I put? That expression right there. So that says as I'm going into this loop, ask 
you know, figure out what the ending of the loop is going to be. Now, another kind of subtle difference between the do loop and the for next loop is that this do loop checks this condition at the end of each loop. It gets down here and it says, this true or false? It's true. Keep going. A loop while. It's true. Keep going. Is this true or false? It's true. Keep going. Is this true or false? It's true. Keep going. The for next loop checks this once. I'm getting ready to come to this loop. I'm going to iterate a known number of times. How many times am I going to iterate? Well, from 3,000 to 3,274, and it never looks at that again. So if this loop in here adds more data to the end of that, this thing is still stopping at 3,274. What if this loop added more data to the end? Yeah, it would, it would kind of keep going. I mean, if it added a row every time, it, would, it wouldn't end until it pushed all the way to the down of the worksheet. But you know, might every four iterations, it might add a value or something. So you could still get to the end that way. There's a question over here? Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, so the question is, what's gonna happen if we're not in a cell that's got contiguous data? Um, yeah, this will produce um, 1.04 million, whatever the, that high number is. Uh, yeah, and, and it will, in fact. Let's just, this one, range A1, down here, let's just do this. Let me add a new sheet. Oh, I got a new sheet right here. Let me add another new sheet. And there's nothing on that one, so that one should return 1.048, Anyway, is that really, it's, it's like more than a million, isn't it? Yeah, it's 1.048576 million. There's a question over here. So the other problem that you might think about is what if, what if I wasn't sure that this data was gonna be here? Like what if I had blank row in there and I really do wanna process this kind of whole block of data? What could I do? Well, instead of starting at range A1, I could start at range A, 1 million. Or cells, um, which row do I want? Rows.count, that'll tell me how many rows there are, column one, and instead of going down, what would I do? Excel up. And so this should give me that same cell, even though we've got that empty, we've got that empty block in there now, because it's going all the way to the bottom and it's coming up until it hits data. If I shouldn't have deleted that other one, if I was on cells row number, maybe I did this a little too fast. Let me just do that expression right there. Rows.count is how many rows there are. But if I started at one and went down now, because there's a, there's a break in my sequence, this is gonna end at 3255 because that's where the blank cell was. We'll go ahead and put it back in there and now it'll get to the bottom. So if you have contiguous data, if you know the data is contiguous, start from the top and going down is just fine. If you think, oh, there might be a break in here and I wanna process this whole block, then you start from the bottom and come up. What if there's some other data at the bottom that you don't care about? then you're sunk. There's no way to do it. You're just gonna have to use Google Sheets or something. You have to have more, more your code would have to be, you know, you'd have to have more logic around it to figure out just what you're talking about. Go ahead. Would that still print like the blank row? Oh, would it, would it, would it print that blank, oh, would it print that blank row? <laughs> would it print that blank row if, um, um, if there was a blank one in it? And the answer is, no, it wouldn't. So if we were missing here and we we're starting from the top and coming down, where would we get to? Control down and out takes us right to here. And so it won't print this one. But if we're coming from the bottom up, then you know it would take us here to the end. And that would say that's the ending number. We're still starting from the top and coming down. And we would hit this blank cell and we would still print whatever's there. In this case, we're printing column three, so it would, it would print this one. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so now we've, we've made this now really equivalent to the one we had for the do loop demo, and that is, we don't know how many, how many rows there are, so when we start the loop, let's ask the question, how many rows, where do we really wanna stop, and then, and then run the code from there. But the important difference here is that we only look at this once. And so if the exit condition changes while the loop's running, doesn't matter, we're still, we're iterating a known number of times. Now, Couple other things about this. The next R adds what to R? It adds one, 
unless I specify something different. Here's how I specify something different. Step, S-T-E-P, I'll say step one, and that you'll notice that now prints every single one. So 2, 372, 374, but I could step two. Um, clear that. And now it's only doing the even ones. What about step three? I'm never going to hit. I mean, this thing, this, this still evaluates to 3,274. I'm not going to hit three, uh, 274 now. Am I, am I doomed? Have I just created an endless loop? And the answer is no. Um, but it does skip 74 because that doesn't have to be one of the ones that it's added to. But as it turns out, the reason that I get out of this loop is not because the control variable equals this, it's because the control variable exceeded it. The control variable went out of bounds. And because it went out of bounds, that's when it goes, I'm done. There's a question in here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is, I did, the question is, well, what if instead of step three, what if right before the next R, I said R equals R plus two. So now R is going to start off at 3,000. I'm going to hit this. It's going to be 3,002. This is now going to add, well, this will add one, but combined with this, it'll add three. So yeah, that's right. It is exactly identical. Um, but what they're saying is, hey, this loop is designed to increment variables. And so instead of making you do that, we will put it right up here. Step three. Yeah, if I don't tell it what to add, it will add one. Questions? Question here. It, that, that would not change the way the loop behaves, and even for the out of bounds condition. That's right, exactly the same. So, in fact, let's just go ahead and print, and when we're done here, let's just print off R. Um, so, the final value of R is, and we can catenate R onto that. So, that makes sense. We were, we were on 3273, we added three to it, and we're 3276, so we're out of bounds. But the thing that's a little bit strange is if I don't put the step or I leave it at step one, okay, so now it's the very last one is 3274. What is this gonna print when this prints out? What will it print? Yeah, 3275, uh, and again, it's because when I come up here, you know, I, I, I start off at 3000, I get the next R, I come up here to the top and I go, is it out of bounds? No, it's not out of bounds. Uh, 3001, not out of bounds. 3000, 3073, uh, 273, not out of bounds. 3274, not out of bounds. And it comes in and prints it, adds one to it, 3275, out of bounds. But it actually has to move the control variable out of the boundary before it exits the loop. And so um, that's why you kind of end up with a, you know, when, when, when you're done, the variable is still there and it has a value that it never executed the loop with. Just the way, the way it goes. Okay, last thing here is I can step backward. Negative one. This does two things. By putting a negative number in the step, it does two things. First, it, it, it adds a negative one. I guess it doesn't really change that. It's still adding negative one. It's adding whatever value I have there. But now, because the negative number, it's going to reverse the exit condition, right? With a positive number, it's going to execute until it, well, I guess it still is going out of bounds. This is, the, this is the boundary. So how many times is this going to print the code? What's this going to print? How many times did it print? How many times did it execute the loop? None. Yeah, this comes after the loop. And so what it's doing is it's saying, all right, for R equals 3,000 to um, whatever this is, and we're going to go backwards. Let's see. So we're going to add for R equals 3,000 to that. I'm kind of wondering. I must be dehydrated. My brain is not operating very well right now. Why doesn't this even come in once? 3,000. 
the X, well, the R starts off at 3,000, and we're going to execute until this is, Roger, we haven't incremented it yet. Interesting. So my thought was, if I hadn't, I would have said, you know, this probably runs once, because it's not out of bounds now. We're stepping backwards. Anyway, it's kind of an academic part here. Let's show how this is supposed to work. And that is, I'm going to start at a higher number now, and I'm going to go to a lower number. And so now that should behave the same as it did before, except it'll count backwards. It's going to start at, it's going to give R's initial value as 3,274, and it's going to count backwards until we hit 3,000. We'll execute with 3,000, we'll go out of bounds, and it should print 2,999. So you can see we're coming down 19, 18, 17, 3, 2, 1, 0, liftoff. Um, and then again, we're out of bounds here. Yeah, truth is I would have expected that to execute the first time through here because it wasn't out of bounds. But apparently it's smart enough to go, oh, we're counting backwards. We're already there. Let me out. It's kind of interesting. Okay, that's the four next loop. Questions? Okay, another kind of loop. Uh, and for this one, let's go ahead and start, let's start with the four next loop. So I'm going to copy my four next loop example, third and final kind of loop. Instead of the four next loop demo, this is the for each loop demo. Okay, so what we said for the four next loop is there's something we do so often, iterate a known number of times and increment a variable across the specified range. We do that so often, we made a specific loop for it. Uh, another thing that we do a whole lot is we have a collection of objects, a set of objects. Someone give me a built-in collection. What's the name of a built-in collection? Any built-in collection will do? Worksheets, yeah. It's a set of all worksheets in a given workbook. Workbooks is a set of all currently open workbooks. We say, listen, we've got that collection of objects. We want to do something to all of them. Why? We want to do the same thing to all of them. And that's what the for each loop is for. In fact, I'm going to, um, I'm going to do two of these sub for each and sub. Let me start with a simpler one and then we'll convert this one to do exactly the same thing. For each loop demo two. Okay. So let me dim S as a worksheet. And now let me set S equals, actually I have this already. I'm gonna copy this line in. And now I'm gonna do a debug.print. Of S dot name. Okay, that should print the counties so I'll run that. Yeah. Let me clear this off. I have an error here set S equal to worksheets count. It looks pretty good. S dot name. This is like I've typed mismatch, but I don't see where it is. Oh, that says workbook. This has to be worksheet. See, I, 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 I told the interpreter the only kind of object I'm going to bind this variable on is a workbook, and then I tried to bind it onto a worksheet, and it said you can't do that. Okay, so that prints counties. Now, instead of doing setting it to the county sheet, let me set it to the first sheet. What's the first sheet in my workbook? Counties, yeah, it's still counties. I got counties, then I got sheet one and sheet two. So this should do exactly the same thing. Now, I wanna do all three of those sheets. So I'm gonna, don't copy this, just watch this part. We're gonna, I'm about to delete it. I'm gonna set it to sheet number one, sheet number two, sheet number three, and then it's gonna print off all three of those. Right, print off all three. Well, I don't wanna to have to do that. I've only got 100 sheets. I don't wanna do that for each one. Instead, I wanna have a loop. It just says however many there are, just go and do it. I wanna do the same thing to every worksheet in this collection. Now, the way I've done it here is by binding it to the first one, binding it to the second one, and binding it to the third one. That's what the for each loop does. Automatically, it takes a control variable, it's an object variable, 
and it binds it on, for each iteration of the loop, it binds it onto a different element of the collection. So, um, let me set that up now. Instead of, instead of doing any of this, I'll leave the debug.print. I'm gonna say four. Now, four next, four x equals, or four, you know, some variable equals. In this case, I say for each s in this workbook dot worksheets. And then I will have next. Again, you can say the control variable here if you want to, you don't have to. So now, remember the example we had was bind s onto a worksheet, print s's name. Bind s onto a different worksheet, print s's name. Bind s onto a different worksheet, print its name. Here, the loop is doing it for us. The first time through the loop, it binds s onto the first worksheet in the collection, which is counties. It will print counties. Then it binds it onto the next one, which is sheet one, then onto sheet two. So this should print off the same thing right back up here. I'll delete that and run this. And we've put it right back. So the loop itself now does what I did by hand, binding that variable onto a different worksheet. We say this is so common that we want to execute this code against every element of this collection that we've got a loop specifically written for it. Yeah. Yeah, for, in fact, let's go ahead and do that. The question is like for each cell in a range, let's go ahead and convert this to that same way. So um, I still got S for my worksheet, that's fine, but let me dim a, a different control variable. Instead of R, I'm going to dim cell as a range. Now, you might be tempted to look at this and think, oh, cell must be some reserved word. No, this is, this is just a variable. I could call this R or C or Q or any, anything I want to, as long as it's a valid variable name, uh, I'm gonna call it cell. And so now we will say for, now we've got this range defined here. Before we can do this, we've got, this is gonna be a little bit more difficult because I've got to specify this same range. So let's see how I can get to that range here. So I'm gonna, there's a range, kind of a, and we're gonna spend some time seeing all the different ways we can use range. But here I'm gonna specify this as a range made up of, of a starting cell and an ending cell. The first range starts at A3000. That's the first cell in my range. The second cell, which is the ending of my range, is gonna be A3274. A3274. And now I wanna print the address of that range. So this is like, nested range, it seems like a little bit strange, but what this says, it says, okay, if I had call the range method and I give it two other ranges, now here I'm calling the range method, I'm giving it a string. It goes, great, I'm gonna figure out the range from that. In this case, I'm calling the range method and I'm passing it two other ranges. It goes, oh, you mean a contiguous range that starts here and ends here. And so that's what gives us this whole range. It gives me the address of that whole range. So I can take this now without the address and let me go ahead and, and build that. That's the collection that I want to iterate across. So for each cell in that range. Debug.print cell.value. And the truth is, this is not such a normal thing to do with this kind of range, because this is a little extra work to figure out just the range that I'm talking about. This up here is a much more uh, common approach. We say we've got you know, some collection, go across them all. Here, I had to, to get it to behave the same, I had to you know, identify that kind of strange collection. But if I run this now, it should do exactly the same thing that it did before, uh, except R is not defined here. So I'm gonna get rid of the final uh, cell, the final cell is cell dot address. Okay. Very well to find, oh, not a next R, it's next cell, or I can just leave it off. It's okay not to put it at all. Debug got print, the final cell is, oh, when it comes out of the loop, cell is no longer bound to any one of those objects. So it, it sets it to nothing. Um, so if I asked at this point, what is the type of cell? Is it nothing? Yeah, it's nothing. So 
nothing, in VBA it turns out nothing is something. Nothing is an object that if you have an object variable that's not bound on anything else, it's bound on nothing. It's the only object that doesn't have either properties or methods. It's just an object. Anyway, um, so the point is when we're done iterating this, cell is not bound on to any of those. Just like in the for next loop, R was not, it was not the value of any of the ones that I operated on. It's kind of similar here. Cell isn't bound on to any of the ones that it was bound on to during the run. But we see how, so I'm gonna just get rid of this line. We can see how it's running through that same set. Um, oh, and it's not, but it's not A, it's C is what has the names in it. We were printing off names before. So let me go ahead and run that. And now we're still getting this. Hmm. But we don't have, I mean, before we were showing the row number because we we're using R to get there. Well, we can do that too because we can, we can actually print cell.row. And this will show us the row number that we're, that we're executing on. Questions? Out of all three of these loops, which one's the most difficult? Yeah, the for each is the most difficult because it's, it's way more abstract. We're dealing with integer, there's nothing to, I mean, there's nothing happening behind the curtain for the do loop. What happens behind the curtain for the for next loop? It's just adding a, a value to a variable. This one, the for each loop, quite a bit more complex because we're binding an object variable onto a different object in the collection for each run. Questions? Here. So in range and inside the range, if you didn't happen to own the parameter there and you come in, would you now continue to use the same for? Um, so and change this to two. No, just code range and then C three thousand. Oh. Okay, let me let me do it this way. That would have been a simpler way to do it. Yeah, that does, that does, that does exactly the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it just becomes a little bit more difficult for us to figure this out. The other syntax, because it's just one cell, we can use that same trick for end down to figure out what it is. Whereas this one, we have to use some kind of string concatenation, find out the row, concatenate it on. But yeah, if I execute this, it'll do the same thing. Okay, one more thing that I wanna to cover today, uh, and that is this is this idea that you can put a loop inside of another loop. So let's do this. Let me change this from, not to print the row, I just wanna print the values. And I'm gonna start with A, 3000, to C, 3274. Now, I'm, now my block is three columns wide. What do you think it's gonna do? It's gonna print, well, will it print all the county names together or will it intersperse the county names with the other data? In other words, will it go across the rows first, go across that row, and then go down, go across that row, go down, or will it go down that whole first column and then move to the next column? It turns out it goes row by row. So if I run this, it'll print all that out, but it does column A, column B, column C. Column A, column B, column C. So what if I wanted it to go the other way? What if I wanted it to go all the way down this one then all the way down the next one, all the way down the next one. So let's look at, I'm gonna copy my for next loop. And I'm gonna call this nested loop demo. Okay, so the code right now already, uh, it's going through column C, so let me put it onto column one. So now this is gonna go through column eight, it'll just print off those numbers. Now what I would like this to do, um, I mean, it looks, I'll get rid of the, the debug that print at the end here. It should just print off a pot load of numbers. Well, after it does that, I want to move over a column and do the same thing again. Then I want to move over a column and do the same thing again. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I am gonna put another for loop around this one. I'm gonna need a con control variable, dim C as an integer. Columns, uh, there's only like 16,000 columns. And so C is, I mean, it's an integer, so we go 32, so, so C is fine. Integer is fine for referring to columns. So for C 
equals one, two, three. Next. And tab that in so we can kind of see the structure a little bit better. And of course, instead of always printing off column one, I want to print off column C. So the first time we come in through C now gets set to one. And so we go, great, C is one. Then we go, ah, oh, R is going to be, oh, we're counting backwards. That's okay. R is going to be 3,274. We're counting backwards. Actually, I don't like it that. I'm going to, I want this one to count forward. So R now becomes 3,000 and we go 3,000, 3,001, 3,002, 3,003. We do all of this loop here and C has never changed from one. Once we finish going through all of that one, we hit the next here, sends us back up to the top. What happens to C? It goes to two and we hit this one again. And it goes 3,000, 3,001, 3,002 all the time. C now is fixed for all those runs at two. We're finished with that. We come up here, C now becomes three and we set R right back to 3,000 again and we run that again. So now it should print off that same set of data that our for each loop demo did, but now just in a different sequence because it goes through all the numbers, does all the states, and then does all the counties separately. It turns out that uh, you can nest loops to your heart's content in VBA. There may be some limit like 32 levels of nesting or something. I've never gotten close to it. Um, but um, the old human processor doesn't do real well with nested loops. And so anytime you're doing a nested loop, you say to yourself, okay, I got to think very carefully about what we're doing because this is a place that is tough for a human brain to, to deal with. Is that Brunson? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so the question here is, what if, how come I didn't say next C? And the answer is, you don't have to put next, you don't have to put the control variable here ever. The interpreter can figure out next, it has to go to this four. It's like, am I going to be confused? Oh, this next sends us up to this one. No, it doesn't. It knows it's got to go to the closest level, the ones at the, ones at the same level. But anytime we're nesting, I like to put the control variable in there um, because, I mean, this is, so, this is trivial because it's so simple. But most often, you can't see the loop on one screen. And so you're kind of scrolling down. There's next. What is that next for? Ah, that's next for R. That's the next for C. Bronson, you have a really deep voice. I mean, I, for a minute there, I was transported to the Lion King. I thought Mufasa's alive. <laughs> okay. Um, other questions? All right. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed. <laughs>